promising young skier at Middlebury College in 1988 when a skiing accident left him paralyzed from the waist down. Determined to get back on the slopes, he began skiing on a monoski roughly one year later. Chris went on to become the most decorated male monoskier in Paralympic history, winning 13 medals over four games and spending a total of 11 years on the U.S. disabled ski team. He is one of only a handful of athletes to win medals in both summer and winter games. In 2009, Chris became the first paraplegic to summit Mount Kilimanjaro. He went with a team and a camera crew dedicated to documenting the historic climb. One Revolution, the documentary that they produced, has won prestigious awards at film festivals throughout the world. Chris has been featured on Dateline, Oprah, and 2020, awarded the Dalai Lama's Unsung Hero of Compassion Award, inducted into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame, and was named one of People's Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People. Now I am pleased to introduce Chris Waddell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. How are you guys doing this morning? You guys all wide awake, ready to go? Yes. Yeah, kind of. That wasn't super enthusiastic, but okay, we'll see. I'm going to need some help from you as we go along. You okay with that? Yes. Okay, perfect. My program's called Name Tags, and we've all worn a name tag like this, haven't we? Yes. Hello, my name is, usually it says our name, right, which seems appropriate, but we wear a bunch of other name tags too, don't we? Based on how we look, how we talk, where we're from, whether we have to wear a uniform to school, right? I mean, different name tags, right? And sometimes, these name tags can be a little bit misleading. I'm going to show you a quick little video and then we're going to get to it. Diminished. Less. Invisible. Outcast. Ostracized. Infirm. These words are often used to define disability. But if we open our minds, we might see something different. what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. So, anyway, these name tags that we can wear sometimes can be limitations, can't they? Like my wheelchair in a lot of ways is a name tag, isn't it? Comes with some expectations and potentially some limitations. This is where I'm gonna need your help. Our motto is it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. So when I count to three, I want this side of the room to say it's not what happens to you. You guys feel cool with that? All set? Okay, you're not too nervous? You sure, a little bit? Anyway, oh yeah, and then this side over here, you're gonna answer them with, it's what you do with what happens to you. Okay, you ready? You sure? All right, let's see how it works. Ready, one, two, three. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. Exactly, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. And it's really easy to say those words when they're up there on the screen, right? 
You're like, I know all those words, I know them in that context, I know what they mean, and then something goes wrong and we go, oh, I can't believe what happened to me, right? And so we're gonna do this again. As we go along, you'll have three more opportunities to do this. I want you to make it your own. I mean, you, you don't have to do it in unison, you can do it in a funny voice if you want, I don't care, but you gotta make it your own. You gotta make it personal, right? Because you gotta remember it when something goes wrong to be like, oh yeah, it's not what happens to me, it's what I do with what happens to me. Now part of the reason that I'm here today is that almost 28 years ago I had a skiing accident. I was a ski racer in college, my first day of Christmas vacation. I went home, my brother and I went to the mountain where we'd grown up racing, met up with a few buddies, took a couple of runs before we were gonna train that day, and in the middle of a turn my ski popped off. Fell in the middle of the trail, didn't hit anything but the ground, and I broke two vertebrae. Damaged the spinal cord. So my life changed potentially really significantly in that moment. We're talking about the name tags, the labels that we can wear. Before my accident, it was about who I was. First priority was that I was a student. Like you, that was my priority. My father was a teacher. If I didn't do well in school, I didn't get to do much of anything else. But some of what I thought made me different was that I was a ski racer. And I thought by virtue of being a ski racer, it showed people that I was able and that I could do whatever I wanted to do and that I'd be successful, which is all of our hope, right? I mean, we want to feel like we can be successful, but then I had my accident and it wasn't as much about me as it was about what had happened to me. So some things don't change though. I continued to be a student, but when a lot of people saw me, they didn't see me. They saw that I was a paraplegic, they saw that I couldn't walk. They didn't see me, they saw what they perceived that I couldn't do. So suddenly I'd gone from feeling like I could do whatever I wanted to do and that I'd be successful to feeling like I was disabled, like I was on the outside looking in. It can make you feel really alone. So I want to do a quick little exercise just to illustrate this point. So can I get everybody with a yellow card to stand up, please? Okay. All right, you can sit back down. You can sit back down. How about, are there people with blue cards out there? Can I get you to stand up? All right. Okay, all right. Okay, sit back down. Thing is, kind of, it was easier for the second group than it was the first group, right? Second group was like, oh, nothing happened to the first group, so that's okay. First group, you guys, I'm looking at you guys right here. You're looking at your cards like yellow, mm-hmm, yellow, mm-hmm, still yellow. Okay, now I'm gonna stand up. Okay, I'm standing up. And the thing is, you have no idea what I might make you do, right? And there's a chance I might make you look stupid, right? Making you feel a little uncomfortable, just making you stand up. And the thing is, you start looking around, don't you? You start looking around, you're like, okay, 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 I wanna make sure, if this guy makes me look stupid, I wanna make sure that I have a friend because I don't wanna look stupid alone, we're gonna look stupid together, right? How often do we do this, right? We're, look, we're looking to make sure that we don't look stupid alone. Now, now, the greatest risk that you guys can take is taking no risk at all. It's really easy to go through school and you finish and somebody says to you, what do you want to do? And you go, I don't know. And they're like, well, you can do whatever you want to do. And you say, well, can you narrow that down a little bit? Because I really don't know what I'm all about because I've been following the crowd the whole time. Now, Einstein was kind of smart, right? And Einstein said, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live the rest of its life believing it's stupid. And obviously, fish don't climb trees, right? But what he's saying is that we judge everybody by the same criteria, by the same test, by the same standard, it's really easy to feel stupid, right? Because there are people who are good in math, there are people who can build their own computers, there are people who help everybody get along. Like invariably there are conflicts, there are those peacemakers, right? And there's so many different kinds of genius, aren't there? But if we're only looking for one kind, it's really easy for all of us to feel stupid, isn't it? Now, things are gonna go wrong, aren't they? For all of us. Like no matter who we are, things are gonna go wrong. Are you guys ready? I think this is your line, are you ready? One, two, three. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. All right, good deal. I like that I gave you permission to interpret it however you choose and you're in complete unison. Hmm, interesting that. Anyway, yes, this is a great mindset, this idea of it's not what happens to you, it's what you do, it's what happens to you. Donna Valpetto created this program with me. Thought, it, thought we needed questions that we could ask ourselves when things went wrong. And the questions are, the first one's about self. It's about me, right? 
Am I a victim or am I a survivor? The situation, is it overwhelming or is it a challenge? Because if it's a challenge, we can win, right? Am I alone or am I part of a team and do I have one strategy or do I have many? So when I was in the hospital, I did not want to be in the hospital. Hospital was for sick people, but I had to be in the hospital because I hurt myself really badly. I went from 175 pounds down to 125 pounds. I was like a baby. I couldn't get out of bed by myself. I couldn't dress myself. They taught me how to dress myself lying in bed, which is kind of hard like when you can move your legs and a whole lot harder when you can't and when you can't sit up. So like just to put my pants on, it was sort of this combination of like a soccer throw-in rodeo lasso kind of thing where I had to throw my pants over my head, hope that I would catch one foot in each pant leg and then I'd pull them halfway up. And then I had to roll over to pull one side up and I'm super, super weak so I'm swinging my arms and I'd pull one side up and then swing my arms back the other way and pull the other side up. I'm covered in sweat by the time I finish. My fly's over my left hip, I'm like really? Like I'm sitting down and I look ridiculous, like this is totally unfair. Now this was the worst thing that I could imagine happening to me but it was also the most powerful I've ever been in my life. And it was the most powerful I've ever been in my life because I didn't have the luxury of getting tripped up. I had to get better every day. So you know how like we get frustrated? Like that's it, I'm done, I quit. I'm not doing it, I'm not gonna get it, right? I didn't have the luxury of being frustrated or the worry. For me that worry was, was you know, am I ever gonna get to what I consider to be better? That was a big step, but I had to take tiny little steps. Or the uncertainty. You know, this was something that tripped me up all the time where it was like, it was, that's for something, somebody smarter than me. That's for somebody cooler than me. It's for somebody richer than me. Like that's, that's for somebody else, that's not for me. These were things that stopped me before I started. And I couldn't let them stop me because if I didn't get a little bit better every day, I might have been stuck in that hospital. That might have been my life. So I got a little bit better, a little bit better. I'm just about ready to leave the hospital and the head doctor called me into his office and he said, you're not ready to leave. And it's totally unfair. Like he's behind the big mahogany desk. He looks really smart, doctorly official. I have my, fly, my, my pants all askew, but I say, okay, why am I not ready to leave? And he said, because you haven't been depressed. I was like, really? Because I kind of thought I was doing well not being depressed. But he was looking at me as a ticking time bomb. Like eventually I'd figure out how much things had changed and then I'd be really depressed. But from the time we're little, we're taught that we can do whatever we want, right? If we're willing to work hard enough, if we're creative enough, we can do whatever we want to do. And at 20 years old, I didn't want somebody to say, you know what, sorry, you can't really do whatever you want to do. So I understood where he was coming from and I said, I promise you, I'll have bad days later, but right now I don't really feel like I have time for bad days. Right now, I've got to prove to myself that I can still do what I want to do, that I can prove to myself that I'm not a victim, that I'm a survivor. When I first started skiing a monoski, this is what it looks like to ski in a monoski. This is not what it looked like the first day. First day, I went out with my college coach. We figured out how to get strapped into this thing, and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know, like we go to the top, right? Like I'd always known how to make a turn as long as I could remember. So. He said, okay, fine, and we went to the top, got off the chairlift, and I fell over. I was like, okay, okay, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different, but making a turn is making a turn. I know how to make a turn. I'm just gonna do it this way. I went to make my first turn, I fell over, he picked me up. This is pretty much the pattern that we established all day. I fell over, he picked me up, I fell over, he picked me up. Totally overwhelming, he kicked his skis off and slid behind me on his boots so mostly I think that he didn't have to pick me up anymore. So they could keep me upright and we could finish that one, one run. But the thing was, that was completely overwhelming. It was still overwhelming even when I found the balance because I was fine going across the hill, but in order to go back across the hill, I had to be pointed down the hill for a little bit. And I felt like I was totally out of control and I was gonna completely kill myself, so it was petrifying. So as I'm going across, I'm looking like 10 inches in front of my ski tips. And what happens if you look at your shoes as you're going along, you walk into walls, right? I kept ending up at the edge of the trail like, really, I'm at the edge of the trail, I have to go back in the other direction. But eventually I went from 10 inches in front of my ski tips to 10 feet to 100 feet to 100 yards. And when I'm looking 100 yards down the hill, suddenly I'm in charge. The mountain isn't pushing me all over anymore. I'm in charge of where I'm gonna go. It went from being overwhelming to being a challenge. And if it's a challenge, 
we can win, right? And we don't do it alone. Does that work? All right, that worked. Who knows why this works? But anyway, uh, so we don't do it alone. The day of my accident, the ski patrol took me down the hill. Ambulance took me to the first hospital. Helicopter did, took me to the second hospital. My parents and my brother went to the second hospital. They're in the waiting room. I finish all the tests. The doctor comes in and he said, your son, your brother, has broken his back. He'll never walk again. And it's a really emotional period of time for them. And they cry. And when they're done, my father said, that's the last time that we can cry. We have to be strong for Chris. Now, the greatest gift that my parents gave to my brother and me as we were growing up was the opportunity to fail. Sounds like a strange gift, right? But that's where we ended up learning the most. We'd fail, and they'd say, well, what are you going to do? It's like, really? Like, it's on me? And they're like, yeah, what are you going to do? How are you going to make this better? They extended that same gift to me when I was in the hospital. As much as they wanted to protect me, they let me make my own decisions. So I was in the hospital for two months. I went back to college, which I went to college in Vermont, to an almost 200-year-old school built out of granite on the top of a mountain in the middle of February. I look back on it and I think, really? That was an absolutely crazy decision, right? Like, why would you make that decision? It was the best decision that I could have made because I was back with my friends and I realized that I hadn't changed that much, that I was still the same person, that my interactions with them were still the same. That was being part of the team. Now, a few years ago, I was in Tibet, long way from home, took 16 hours driving over bumpy dirt roads just to get into China, then I had to fly halfway across the world. And when I landed, I wanted to see what I'd missed. So I drove my car from the airport to my mailbox. And my mailbox isn't one of those in front of the house. It's one of those collective mailboxes at the end of the street. So I drove my car up to the mailbox, parked my car, started pulling my wheelchair out. I'm putting the wheels on, and this little girl rode up. She's like six years old on her little pink bike, pink streamers coming off the handlebars, and she said, what happened to your legs? Beauty of the six-year-olds, right? And the thing is, I didn't really feel like having a conversation with her because I was tired. But from the time we're little, we're taught not to stare at somebody who looks different, aren't we? It's impolite to stare. The problem is, if we never get a chance to ask questions, we never get a chance to know somebody who seemingly is different from us, we probably share a whole lot more in common. We definitely share something that they can teach us. There are 1.1 billion people in the world like me. 1.1 billion people with physical disabilities, like one in six, one in seven, but it's an invisible part of the population because we're taught not to stare, right? So I felt like I'd answer this little girl's question as best I could. I told her what I told you, that I had a skiing accident. And I tried to describe what happened to me in ways that she might be able to understand it. I said, you know those little bumps on your back? Well, those are bones, and those bones protect the nerves, and the nerves take the message from the brain to the rest of the body. So if I want my arm to move, my brain says move, that message goes along those nerves to the muscles in my arm, and my arm moves. But because I broke two of those bones, it's like cutting a power cord. So now the message doesn't go from my brain to my legs or my legs back. Didn't know how well I was doing. Apparently, I was doing pretty well. She said, so you'll never walk again. And I said, no, probably not. And she rode away, and as she rode away, she said, well, that's too bad. And I wish that I had stopped her. Because if I'd never had my accident, I never would have been the best in the world at anything. I was the best monoskier in the world. That's an amazing gift, isn't it, to be the best in the world at something? But it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had my accident. This idea of it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. But the little girl, she just saw the tragedy. She didn't see the potential gift.
somehow, I think that's not what that little girl meant when she said that's too bad, right? It's not, oh, it's too bad that you ski and you climb mountains and you do this other stuff, right? Thing is, things are gonna go wrong for all of us, aren't they? Are you guys ready? There we go, one, two, three. Exactly, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you because the thing is we have the ability to change these name tags, these labels, these limitations that we wear, don't we? When we saw the mind change after my accident, you know, from before my accident to after my accident, after competing, they're probably gonna change again, right? And you know what? Some things don't change. I continue to be a paraplegic. That has not changed, but I also became a world champion, which was pretty cool. Now, the last one is the hardest name tag that I've ever worn. And sometimes we create these name tags, these images for ourselves to keep ourselves safe, don't we? To protect ourselves. We don't want to get picked on. None of us want to get picked on. I was in the hospital for two months and when I went back to school, my friends at school said, I could never do what you've done. In their eyes, oh, come on now. Did it come up? Oh yes, it did come up. Okay, good. Perfect. In their eyes, I became like a superhero, which is kind of cool because it kept me safe because it was so different than the way that I thought people would see me when I was lying there in that hospital bed that then it was about what I couldn't do and they're saying, no, you're a superhero, like you can do more than anybody else, which is really cool, but I was also acting. I was playing a role, I had to play the part of the superhero. So the hardest thing that I ever had to do was retire from competitive sport. When I retired, it was more difficult for me than it was when I broke my back because this idea of being a superhero kept me safe. And when I retired, I thought, where does this image of being a superhero stop? And where do I start? Like, how can I allow myself to be honest? How can I allow myself to be vulnerable? How can I figure out what my power is? What my strength is? And what I came up with was I had to have a goal that was bigger than me myself. And that's when I decided to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, 19,341 foot Mount Kilimanjaro, almost four miles straight up in the air. And I thought if I could get to the top of the highest place that I could find, the people would have to see me. They'd have to see me on the wheelchair to see me and to see the 1.1 billion people like me. Now we estimated it took 528,000 revolutions of my pedals to make it to the top. My organization is called One Revolution. That one little thing that one little thing that we have to do that we put a whole lot of little things together that eventually leads to something big. We do little things every day, right? The choices that we make, the investments that we make in ourselves, right? Little things every day that hopefully add up to something big. Now if I was gonna draw the attention that I needed to draw, I had to do this under my own power. If I was the first unassisted paraplegic to make it to the summit, then I'd be breaking a record. Then it forced people to see me differently and to see the 1.1 billion people like me differently. Problem was, I reached this point on the crater rim, about 18,500 feet and I couldn't get over these boulders. My crew and the porters, they carried me. Carried me for like 100 feet. 100 feet of the 13,000 feet that we climbed from the 6,000 foot base to the 19,000 foot summit. But to me, that 100 feet meant that I failed meant that I failed my team, which worked in sacrifice for two years just to give me the opportunity to try to climb the mountain. So we went from the crater rim down into the crater of the dormant volcano, and I'm crushed. I'm crushed because I feel like I've failed so many people and we've worked so hard and we're not even gonna get a chance to start. I'm also livid, I'm really, really mad, and I keep thinking, I've gotta to talk to Dave, I've gotta to talk to Dave. Now Dave was my guide, will this work? No. Dave was my guide who developed that vehicle so it looks like a Mars rover, like a Mars rover married to arm pedal power. And I finally had a quiet moment going through, the, going through the crater. And I said to Dave, I said, Dave, you disappointed me. You let me lie to all these people. You let me tell them I could do this unassisted. And you knew these boulders were here. You knew that I couldn't do it. And Dave guides throughout the world. And he said, nobody climbs a mountain alone. Everybody does it as part of a team. So this is that light bulb moment for me, that epiphany where I go, oh right, so you mean that I started with this goal to affect the lives of 1.1 billion people, but this is my journey and this is the reason why I do something that's this difficult because you learn about yourself in absolute terms and this is the lesson that I'm supposed to learn because 
from that moment that I was in that hospital bed, I had to be bigger, better, faster, stronger in order to be equal. That I had to say, I can do it myself for fear of being a burden to my friends and family because if I was a burden, then they might leave me. And as we made it to the top the next day, I had made peace with it, that this was the lesson I was supposed to learn. But we also, we needed the media, we needed newspapers and magazines and television and radio to tell our story if we were gonna affect the change that we wanted to affect. And then I looked at the, and I didn't know what they were gonna say, but then I looked at the guy next to me, and Tajiri had been a porter on the mountain. He was up early one morning, carrying the gear, well before I ever met him, and there was a rock slide. A rock slide that killed three people who were still asleep in their tents. It literally ripped Tajiri's leg off of his body. And we're talking about the name tags, the labels, the limitations that we can wear. Sometimes in developing countries, they believe that a disability shows that God is punishing you and your family, that you've done something worthy of punishment. And when we first met Tajiri, my producer on the film said, he should climb with us, it'd be so great to have an African, a former reporter reconnecting with the mountain. And I said, I don't think he can do it. This belief, this limitation that God was punishing him, he seemed like he'd given up. But they impressed upon me, we needed to help him, so we bought him a new prosthetic leg, one that fit him better, one that was lighter. He went out and he trained, and the first day back in the mountain, he said to the other porters, you never thought you'd see me here again. Well, I'm back. And he was, so I was worried about the media, but this guy became an example that God wasn't punishing him and his family. We've gotta learn from those examples, don't we? I mean, how often do we say that something is impossible? And that's entirely true, right? Until somebody does it. And if somebody's gonna do it, why not us, right? Why aren't we the ones who break that, that idea of it being impossible? Just one, just one. Just one, two of them. Okay, okay. Let's just keep going. Said he was going to climb Kilimanjaro. I thought, well, how are you going to do that? And so, with the new leg, are you? Will you be ready? Uh, I wish. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you were ready. Yeah, yeah. 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 You'll be ready. You'll be ready. Yeah, okay. sure. I think it's a huge challenge. But of all the mountains that you can choose from out there, it seems like Kilimanjaro is probably the right one. It's steep, high. I would have been trying to encourage him to do is to accept the way he is now. Chris, go get him. Thank you, sir. I mean, some of us put goals out there that are so easy to achieve that we never fail. Chris puts goals out there that are extremely difficult, that have an aspect that you could fail at. It's a public attempt at this mountain. It's a public attempt to, to make a statement. We keep talking about it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you, which is a great mindset. And we also mentioned the questions that we can ask ourselves. We'll just review that just quickly. So am I a victim or am I a survivor? Was I gonna be the guy in the hospital bed or was I gonna continue to prove that I could do whatever I wanted to do? Right? Victim or survivor. Now, I'm assuming that a few of you out there play video games, right? And if you play video games, you keep coming back to that same video game, right? It's like you die and you're like, okay, I'm coming back to it. I'm going to finish this thing. I'm going to do it. Why can't we take that mentality into our everyday lives? Something goes wrong. You go, oh, well, I guess I must just be at a new level, right? Like there's a chance to win, right? If it's overwhelming, there isn't. But if, there, if it's a challenge, there's a chance to win. Nobody climbs a mountain alone. And do we have one strategy or do we have many? We have many strategies, right? Thomas Edison developed the light bulb. He didn't do it overnight, did he? 
Not at all. He said, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways it won't work. Had to find a lot of ways it would not work before he found the one way that would. Right? Now, we also talked about the greatest risk you take is taking no risk at all. So Wayne Gretzky was the greatest hockey player ever, and he said, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. If you don't take a shot, you're guaranteed not to score. If you don't take a risk, you might not ever find that genius that Einstein was talking about. That thing that you have to contribute to the rest of the world, right? And that'd be a huge tragedy, wouldn't it? Now, Michael Jordan was pretty good at what he did too, right? I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. I love that video because so often we want to look at somebody who's as successful as Michael Jordan, like best guy ever, right? Like, and you think, he never had to fail. And he's like, no, no, I failed over and over and over again, and that's why I succeed. So often we want to think of failure as like a brick wall, right? Like, that's it, I failed, I'm done, I'm not moving forward. He's like, no, it's not a brick wall, it's a stepping stone. If we try and we fail and we learn from that failure, we're far more likely to succeed, right? Now, you guys have your cards. I want you to do three things with this card. First thing, I want you to write down how do you want people to see you? Because you know that genius that Einstein was talking about? You might be the only one who knows it's there. How are you going to get people to see that? First part is to write it down. Second part is to take this card and put it someplace you're going to see it. Like maybe you tape it to the mirror where you brush your teeth. You know, in the, in the morning, you're like, that's the person I want to be today. And then you go back at night and you go, was I that person? Now, in the spirit of sharing, the name tags that I'm trying to live up to are that I want to be fit, creative, and productive. So productive to me is kind of like getting my homework done. It's like if I'm efficient and I get my work done, I can do the other things that in some ways are my quality of life. If I get a workout in, I feel far happier. I'm more focused. I sleep better. And the creative part, I have a children's book that's coming out this month. So I had to learn how to draw in order to do this. I wrote the thing and I had to stick figures and I had to learn how to draw, which was amazing to me because I thought either you could or you couldn't. But I read this book about learning how to draw, which is all about how you saw the thing as opposed to what you did necessarily with your hands. She said, if you can write your name, you have the dexterity to draw. But it's all about your vision. And so I did it and things started looking like what they were supposed to look like and I was amazed. But that process of going from something that I had no idea that I could do to being relatively proficient at it, I, it was amazing. It was this really cool growth that forced me to go, I wonder what else I can do. And I want to be fit, creative, and productive. Now, no matter how smart we are, no matter how educated we are, no matter how strong we are, no matter how rich we are, things are going to go wrong, aren't they? And when things go wrong, are you guys ready? This is the last one. It's a lot of energy. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens to you. Exactly. It's not, it's not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. Because successful people like Michael Jordan, it's not like they didn't have to struggle. They just struggled better and longer than the rest of us. Right? When we were going to quit, they kept struggling. That's how they got to be the best. Now, the third thing that I want you to do with your cards, is it going to work? We can go one more. There we go. Oops. Yes, that should work. OK, is when you do your name tags, if you could take a picture of yourself and post it in hashtag name tags revolution, there is a contest going on. And the contest is that we will give one of our hoodies from One Revolution, from my organization, our very cool hoodies, uh, to one person in each school. And if you are the best school, you might get a film screening of my Kilimanjaro climb. So if you guys could do that, that would be awesome. So write down your name tags, hashtag name tags revolution, and put, take a picture of it and post it wherever 
you guys like to post things on social media. Anyway, so that's the end of my program, but I do have time for some questions, I think, right? Do I have time for questions? I'm making sure if there are any questions. If there are no questions, then you have to go back to class. So, so that's pretty much it. So no questions? No. Okay, here we go. All right, right here. So can I get you to stand up and tell me your name and then ask your question, please? Um, I'm, I'm Natali. Uh -huh. My question is that, did you feel like, like did you feel that you couldn't do something? Did I feel that I couldn't do something? You know what? There are a lot of times that I feel like I can't do something. I mean, it's not like, it's not like that doesn't happen all the time. You know, it's like, oh, I don't think I can do that. And then it's like, how can I figure out how to do it? You know, I think that's the human response is that that seems like something that's really great. That's something I'd love to do. I don't know if I can do it, but let's try. So yeah, it happens to me all the time. If I could go back, it's a great question. If I could go back to what happened, would I change anything? You know, I mean, I'd love to be able to stand. I'd love to be able to walk again. But I wouldn't want to change the experiences and the person that I've become. So I wouldn't want to change that the accident had happened. Our lives take so many twists and turns. And sometimes we have this great plan of like, this is the way things are going to work. The Dalai Lama once said that, that sometimes not getting what you want can be the greatest gift of all. It's not always obvious in the moment, but no, I wouldn't want to change anything. I really wouldn't. So yeah, I wouldn't want to change the experiences that, because we don't know, right? We can always speculate, well, if that hadn't happened, ever, this is what would have happened. And it's like, okay, yeah, you can think that, but that might not be exactly true too, right? So yeah, no, I'm happy with where I am. Do I struggle to, to acknowledge that I can't walk? You know, I mean, I don't, like, like it's, it's a good question. And so I don't encounter much of anything on a given day that I can't do. But it was funny, because I was doing, I, one year I think I did three months of these kinds of presentations. And I was going along, and I went home, and, and I talked to, I had, I had studied some yoga, and, and I had dinner with my yoga instructor, and I said, you know, I feel like I haven't quite accepted the accident. And, and I was trying to figure out what that meant, like what it meant to accept it. And she said, really, why, why, do you have to, why do you have to make it that difficult? It's just a change in direction. And I was like, oh, well, that makes it a whole lot easier. And so, so yeah, I mean, I miss walking, but, but the acceptance part of the whole thing, I think that it really is a change in direction. It's not something I can change. And so if I'm just regretting that it happened, then I'm sort of stuck in the past, right? And I'm stuck in the past, it prevents me from doing whatever I want to do in the future. It prevents me from doing a lot of it. So, so I don't really, no, I really don't. No, not on most days. OK. What was the most important lesson you learned? What was the most important lesson that I learned? I think the most important, and I'm still learning this lesson, is like that idea of like the one little thing like leads to some big things, is that showing up every day is what gets you to where you want to go. Just con continuing to grind and continuing to do it is the thing that, that gets you there, the patience. I, I feel like in some ways I have sort of a sprinter's mentality. I was a sprinter and I was like, I'm willing to work really hard and I'm willing to hurt, like I'm willing to hurt so much that my, like my teeth hurt and my hair hurts, but then I want to stop. And, and the lesson that I'm learning is that you never really stop, that you keep going and keep plugging, and that that's, that's really where you end up getting where you want to go. And those are the most successful people. So, Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You guys have been an awesome crowd. Thank you. Have a great day. And great year.